Happy New Year, everyone. Today, we're going to start a session by throwing a question at you. When you are troubleshooting noise-related issues, would you prefer a spectral analyzer that is used in frequency domain, or would you prefer an oscilloscope that is used in time domain? Now, we got a perfect case study for you. In the past few weeks, we got an inquiry while the product failed at 600 megahertz and it's a broadband radiated emission failure and we can easily see the noise using a spectrum analyzer but in order to find the root cause we have to use the oscilloscope then you can really correlate what you see in the time domain to the frequency domain so let's have a look at this case study and i hope you enjoyed it and really appreciate uh, the beauty of using oscilloscope in troubleshooting noise-related issues. Enjoy! Because of the confidentiality of the product, it's a client's product, I cannot share the details. However, I can share this part of the circuit which um, caused the radiating emission. So this is the Texas Instrument chip. It's a chip that has or well, basically is used for charging application. Um, part of the chip can drive a buck converter and that's what it does okay so that's the output inductor of the buck converter okay those capacitors here are the input capacitors to the buck converter as shown in the schematics this little chip here has two mosfets high side and low side mosfets as a synchronized uh, buck converter now interesting is notice this device here and that is the short key diode First, I noticed that this short key diode is in parallel with the low side of the MOSFET of the buck converter. Basically, look at this chip here. As I said, these are dual package, right? So two MOSFETs packed in one package. So the low side MOSFET is in parallel with this um, short key diode. Now notice how big the size of the two MOSFETs are and look at the size of the short key diode. This is much larger than this. And on top of that, the trace that link, well, basically this is in parallel with this, but look at the trace connection. So from here, you have to run a long trace connected to the short key diode at this end and the other end is basically ground, okay? So if you look at the inductance caused by the loop, that's the loop area we're talking about. So easily 10 to 20 nanohenry just by, you know, just by looking at it. So my initial thought is, could it be the lead inductance caused by the trace and track um, resonates with some capacitance? So as you can see from this picture showing here, I actually you know, disconnect the short key and then sort of find a uh, better connection, right? Uh, but still, the, the results stay pretty much the same. When removing this short key diode, the radiated emission, well, particularly in 600 megahertz where it failed radiated emissions, improved significantly. We're talking about 20 dB in the far field measurement. And talking to the client, this short key diode is placed here really just to better uh, improve the efficiency because you know the conduction loss by using the short key is slightly less than the body diode of the MOSFET. But then arguably I can say, why don't you use the RDS on of the MOSFET to conduct heat rather than using the body diode of the low side of the MOSFET, right? So basically, if you don't understand the details of this, but, but what we can say is this short key is a little bit redundant, right? So you better just uh, remove it and you can still the whole circuit function well and you can pass the EMC without even adding any extra filter component. So great, isn't it? But the question we are going to ask today really is, now, why this little short key diodes in parallel with the synchronous converter cause the emissions, and we are talking about broadband emissions, broadband radio emissions in 600 and 700 megahertz? That's the question we're trying to ask. And how can we prove, right? Of course, you can prove it by removing the uh, short key diode, as we said, right? But how can we better prove um, whatever the assumptions we have for this circuit. Now I'm going to show you. In order to prove um, what we suspected, which is you know a, a resonance caused by the short key diodes, it could be the lead 
inductance of the trace and track, or it could be the you know the parasitic inductance of the Schottky diode itself resonance with the parasitic capacitance of the Schottky diodes. Um, but you know we suspect there's a resonance somehow in 600 megahertz, um, and time domain measurements can often review you know the resonance when we measure a sort of waveform switching waveform if we look at the peak to peak waveform and measure the time interval and then do the math, then we can calculate the resonance frequency. Uh, so in this case, we're using a time domain measurement using an oscilloscope, okay? So here's my 500 megahertz bandwidth RIGO oscilloscope, and you can see, because we are trying to use a voltage measurement first, okay? So I'm, I try my best to reduce the measurement error, because most of the measurement error at high frequency and high speed is due to the ground lead inductance. So in this case, you can see my I cut. Uh, well, I made this special ground lead, so my inductance of the ground or the earth leads, right? In this case, is pretty small. So that's one way of reducing the error. However, you know the tip basically itself has some capacitance, and for high frequency, high speed measurements, this capacitance inside the tip, often twenty picofarad ish might be large enough to load the circuit as we demonstrated in the past, right? If that happens, then you know you won't be able to measure the resonance we wanted to see. But let's try it, okay? So I, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to measure the voltage waveform across the diodes, okay? The shorty diodes. Yeah, there we go. So you can see the voltage waveform. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop it. This is the voltage waveform during the switching events. And you can see with the um, Shockey diodes, there's an overshoot, okay, each time when you switch. And we compare this without the short key. When I remove the short key, we can compare, right? And without the short key, this overshoot is a lot less. So now let's zoom in and have a look at the resonance. Okay, so if I zoom in, so you can see there is a overshoot and ringing. So let's place the cursor, okay, and the first peak and the second peak, and that's the time interval I measured. And you can see it's about 3 nanoseconds from the measurement, and it's about 526 megahertz ringing. So even though this is a 500 megahertz bandwidth oscilloscope, the XG can capture this resonance quite accurately, I would say, right? Quite accurately. And I'm quite surprised because I thought this probe, being, you know, having a uh, parasitic capacitance of 20 picofarad would load the circuit, but because this is, you know, is a charger circuit and a switching event, so yeah, it's not bad, right? Not bad in this measurement. I can easily see the um, voltage ringing. Um, but what I'm going to do next is show you that perhaps there's a better way of measuring the resonance. Okay, so in order to avoid, you know, this potential loading issue as we discussed, right, the capacitance loading, and a better way of measuring this resonance uh, phenomena would be to use a magnetic field loop, okay? Because when you measure uh, using a magnetic field loop like this, you don't actually touch anything, right? Because you're really using the mutual coupling between the two to measure the signals, right? So that's a better way of measuring resonance phenomena, okay? So in this case, I'm connecting this small magnetic field loop, which I made myself, to channel two, okay? And you can see that channel two currently, we just terminated with a 50 ohm input impedance and we're just measuring voltage. So it's one to one ratio, right? So as we mentioned in the past, right, this, this measurement technique really is just measuring V equals mutual or mutual M di over dt. So effectively, you are measuring a voltage generated across this little conductor, but it represents the di over dt of the circuit on the investigation, right? So for this, let's just measure the um, car well, current, you can call it, or voltage, depends on how you call it, right? So let's measure the waveform using channel 2 in this case, okay? Okay, so. Now we're using the magnetic field probe to measure the di over dt across this Schottky diode. As you can see, the Schottky still sits there. As I get closer, you can already see the current waveform measuring in um, channel two. Okay, see that, right? Depends on um, how you measure it, where you place it. You can basically see the di over dt across this magnetic field probe, which is showing on the screen there. And you can see that the frequency 
uh, measured is 666 megahertz. Okay, so hopefully in this session we demonstrate the ways of troubleshooting radiation emission using a time domain measurement kit, which is a oscilloscope. I, I think the surprising fact is that even this scope is only 500 megahertz bandwidth, has only 500 megahertz bandwidth. We can still use it to troubleshoot a radiant emission beyond 500 megahertz. Um, of course, you can choose the voltage measurement or the current measurement. But personally, for me, I prefer the current uh, measurement techniques because of the potential risk of loading the circuit when you're using a 10 to 1 uh, passive probe. Okay.